The Mithridatic Wars by Appian of Alexandria, translated by Horace White, published in Macmillan, 1899. The Mithridatic Wars As Mithridates was now at leisure, he subdued the tribes of the Bosphorus and appointed Macaris, one of his sons, king over them. Then he fell upon the Achaeans beyond Colchis, who were supposed to be descended from those who lost their way when returning from the Trojan War, but lost two divisions of his army, partly by open war, partly by the severity of the climate, and partly by stratagem. When he returned home, he sent ambassadors to Rome to sign the agreements. At the same time, Ario Brazanes, either of his own notion or at prompting of others, sent thither to complain that Cappadocia had not been delivered up to him, but that a greater part of it was yet retained by Mithridates. Sola commanded Mithridates to give up Cappadocia. He did so, and then sent another embassy to sign the agreements. But now Sola had just died, and, as the Senate was otherwise occupied, the praetors did not admit them. So Mithridates persuaded his son-in-law, Tigranes, to make an incursion into Cappadocia, as though it were of his own accord. This artifice did not deceive the Romans. The Armenian king threw, as it were, a drag net around Cappadocia and made a haul of about 300,000 people, whom he carried off to his own country and settled them, with others, in a certain place where he had first assumed the diadem of Armenia, and which he called after himself Tigranokerta, or the city of Tigranes. While these things were taking place in Asia, Sertorius, the governor of Spain, incited that province and all the neighboring country to rebel against the Romans, and selected from his associates a senate in imitation of that of Rome. Two members of his factions, Lucius Magius and Lucius Fanius, proposed to Mithridates to ally himself with Sertorius, holding out the hope that he would acquire a large part of the province of Asia and of the neighboring nations. Mithridates fell in with this suggestion and sent ambassadors to Sertorius. The latter introduced them to his senate and felicitated himself that his fame had extended to the Pontus, and that he could now besiege the Roman power in both the Orient and the Occident. So he made a treaty with Mithridates to give him Asia, Bithynia, Paphlagonia, Cappadocia, and Galatia, and sent Marcus Varius to him as a general, and the two Luciuses, Magius and Fanius, as counselors. With their assistance, Mithridates began his third and last war against the Romans, in the course of which he lost his entire kingdom, and Sertorius lost his life in Spain. Two generals were sent against Mithridates from Rome, the first, Lucullus, the same who had served as prefect of the fleet under Sulla, the second, Pompey, by whom the whole of his dominions and the adjoining territory as far as the river Euphrates, under the pretext and impetus of the Mithridatic War, were brought under the Roman sway. Mithridates had been in collision with the Romans so often that he knew that this war, so inexcusable and hastily begun, would be an implacable one. He made every preparation with the thought that all was at stake. The remainder of the summer and the whole of the winter he spent in cutting timber, building ships, and making arms. He distributed two million medimni of grain along the coast. Besides his former forces, he had for allies the Calibes, Armenians, Scythians, Taurians, Achaeans, Heniochi, Leucosyrians, and those who occupied the territory about the river Thermodon, called the country of the Amazons. These additions to his former strength were from Asia. From Europe he drew of the Sarmatian tribes, both the Basilidae and the Yazagis, the Korali, and those Thracians who dwelt along the Danube and on the Rhodope and Hymus mountains. And besides these, the Basternae, the bravest nation of all, altogether Mithridates recruited a fighting force of about 140,000 foot and 16,000 horse. A great crowd of roadmakers, baggage carriers, and sutlers followed. At the beginning of the spring, Mithridates made trial of his navy and sacrificed to Zeus Stratius in the customary manner, and also to Poseidon by plunging a chariot with white horses into the sea. Then he hastened against Paphlagonia with his two generals, Taxiles and Hermocrates, in command of his army. 
When he arrived there, he made a speech to his soldiers, eulogistic of his ancestors and still more so of himself, showing how his kingdom had grown to greatness from small beginnings, and how his army had never been defeated by the Romans when he was present. He accused the Romans of avarice and lust of power to such an extent, he said, that they had enslaved Italy and Rome itself. He accused them of bad faith, respecting the last and still existing treaty, saying that they were not willing to sign it because they were watching for an opportunity to violate it again. After thus setting forth the cause of the war, he dwelt upon the composition of his army and his apparatus, upon the preoccupation of the Romans, who were waging a difficult war with Tertorius in Spain, and were torn with civil dissensions throughout Italy. For which reason, he said, that they have allowed the sea to be overrun by pirates a long time, and have not a single ally nor any subjects who still obey them willingly. Do you not see, he added, some of their noblest citizens, pointing to Varius and the two Luciuses, at war with their own country and allied with us? When Mithridates had finished speaking and exciting his army, he invaded Bithynia. Nicomedes had lately died childless and bequeathed his kingdom to the Romans. Cota, its governor, was a man altogether unwarlike. He fled to Chalcedon with what force he had. Thus Bithynia again passed under the rule of Mithridates. The Romans from all directions flocked to Cota at Chalcedon. When Mithridates advanced to that place, Cota did not go out to meet him because he was inexperienced in military affairs. But his naval prefect, Nudus, with a part of the army occupied a very strong position on the plain. He was driven out of it, however, and fled to the gates of Chalcedon over many walls, which greatly obstructed his movement. There was a struggle at the gates among those trying to gain entrance simultaneously, for which reason no missile cast by the pursuers missed its mark. The guards at the gates, fearing for the city, let down the gate from the machine. Nudus and some of the other officers were drawn up by ropes. The remainder perished between their friends and their foes, holding out their hands in entreaty to each. Mithridates made good use of his success. He moved his ships up to the harbor the same day, broke the brazen chain that closed the entrance, burned four of the enemy's ships, and towed the remaining sixty away. Nudus offered no resistance, nor Coda, for they remained shut up inside the walls. The Roman loss was about three thousand including Lucius Manlius, a man of serenatorial rank. Mithridates lost twenty of his bastardi, who were the first to break into the harbor. Lucius Lucullus, who had been chosen consul and general for this war, led one legion of soldiers from Rome, joined with it the two of Fimbria, and added two others, making in all thirty thousand foot and a thousand six hundred horse, with which he pitched his camp near that of Mithridates at Cyzicus. When he learned from deserters that the king's army contained about 300,000 men, and that all his supplies were furnished by foragers or came by sea, he said to those around him that he would presently reduce the enemy without fighting, and he told them to remember his promise. Seeing a mountain well suited for a camp, where he could readily obtain supplies and cut off those of the enemy, he moved forward to occupy it in order to gain a victory, by that means without danger. There was only one narrow pass leading to it, and Mithridates held it by a strong guard. He had been advised to do so by Taxiles and his other officers. Lucius Magius, who had brought about the alliance between Sertorius and Mithridates, now that Sertorius was dead, opened secret communications with Lucullus, and having secured pledges from him, persuaded Mithridates to allow the Romans to pass through and encamp where they pleased. The two legions of Fimbria, he said, want to desert and will come over to you directly. What is the use of a battle and bloodshed when you can conquer the enemy without fighting? Mithridates assented to this advice, heedlessly and without suspicion. He allowed the Romans to go through, to pass unmolested, and to fortify the great hill on his front. When they had possessed themselves of it, they were able to draw supplies from their rear without difficulty. Mithridates, on the other hand, was cut off by a lake, by mountains, and by rivers, from all provisions and on the landward side, except an occasional supply secured with difficulty. He had no easy way out, and could not overcome Lucullus on account of the difficulty of the ground, which he had disregarded when he himself had the advantage. Moreover, the winter was now approaching, and would soon interrupt his supplies by sea. 
As Lucullus looked over the situation, he reminded his friends of his promise, and showed them that his prediction was practically accomplished. Although Mithridates might perhaps even now have been able to break through the enemy lines by force of numbers, he neglected to do so, but pressed the siege of Sisychus with the apparatus he had prepared, thinking that he should find a remedy in this way both for the badness of his position and for his want of supplies. As he had plenty of soldiers, he pushed the siege in every possible way. He blockaded the harbor with a double sea wall and drew a line of circumvallation around the rest of the city. He raised mounds, built machines, towers, and rams protected by tortoises. He constructed a siege engine 50 meters high, from which rose another tower furnished with catapults, discharging stones and various kinds of missiles. Two quinkreams, joined together, carried another tower against the port, from which a bridge could be projected by a mechanical device when brought near the wall. When all was in readiness, he first sent against the city on ships 3,000 inhabitants of Sisychus, whom he had taken as prisoners. These raised their hands towards the wall in supplication, and besought their fellow citizens to spare them in their dangerous position. But Pisistratus, the Sisychian general, proclaimed from the walls that they were in the enemy's hands, and they must meet their fate bravely. When this attempt had failed, Mithridates brought up the machine erected on the ships and suddenly projected the bridge upon the wall and four of his men ran across. The Sisychians were at first dumbfounded by the novelty of the device and gave way somewhat, but as the rest of the enemy were slow in following, they plucked up the courage and thrust the four over the wall. Then they poured burning pitch on the ships and compelled them to back out stern foremost with the machine. In this way, the Sisychians beat off the invaders by sea. Three times on the same day, all the machines on the landward side were amassed against the toiling citizens, who flew this way and that way to meet the constantly renewed assault. They broke the rams with stones, or turned them aside with the nooses, or deadened their blows with baskets of wool. They extinguished the enemy's fire-bearing missiles with water and vinegar, and broke the force of others by means of garments suspended or linen cloth stretched before them. In short, they left nothing untried that was within the compass of human zeal. Although they toiled most perseveringly, yet a portion of the wall that had been weakened by fire gave way toward evening, but on account of the heat nobody was in a hurry to dash in. The Sisychians built another wall around it that night, and about this time a tremendous wind came and smashed the rest of the king's machines. It is said that the city of Sisychus was given by Zeus to Proserpina by way of dowry, and that of all the gods that inhabitants have most veneration for her. Her festival now came around, on which they are accustomed to sacrifice a black heifer to her, and as they had none, they made one out of paste. Just then a black heifer swam to them from the sea, dived under the chain at the mouth of the harbor, walked into the city, found her own way to the temple, and took her place by the altar. The Sisychians sacrificed her with joyful hopes. Thereupon, the friends of Mithridates advised him to sail away from the place since it was sacred, but he would not do so. He ascended Mount Dindymus, which overhung the city, and built a mound extending from it to the city walls, on which he constructed towers, and at the same time undermined the wall with tunnels. As his horses were not useful here, and were weak for want of food, and had sore hoofs, he sent them by a roundabout way to Bithynia. Lucullus fell upon them as they were crossing the river Rindicus, killed a large number, and captured 15,000 men, 6,000 horses, and a large amount of baggage. While these things were transpiring at Sisychus, Eumachus, one of Mithridates' generals, overran Phrygia and killed a great many Romans, with their wives and children, subjugated the Pisidians and the Asarians, and also Kilikia. Finally, Deotarus, one of the tetrarchs of Galatia, drove the marauder away and slew many of his men. Such was the course of events in and around Phrygia. When winter came, Mithridates was deprived of his supplies by sea, if he had any, so that his whole army suffered from hunger, and many of them died. There were some who ate the entrails according to a barbarian custom, Others were made sick by subsisting on herbs. Moreover, the corpses that were thrown out in the neighborhood unburied brought on a plague in addition to that caused by famine. 
Nevertheless, Mithridates continued his efforts, hoping still to capture Sisychus by means of the mounds extending from Mount Didymus. But when the Sisychaeans undermined them and burned the machines on them, and made frequent sallies upon his forces, knowing that they were weakened by want of food, Mithridates began to think of flight. He fled by night, going himself with his fleet to Parius, and his army by land to Lampsacus. Many lost their lives in crossing the river Isippus, which was then greatly swollen, and where Lucullus attacked them. Thus the Sisychaeans escaped the vast siege preparations of the king by means of their own bravery, and of the famine that Lucullus brought upon the enemy. They instituted games in his honor, which they celebrate till this day, called the Lucullian Games. Mithridates sent ships for those who had taken refuge in Lampsacus, where they were besieged by Lucullus, and carried them away, together with the Lampsacians themselves, leaving ten thousand picked men and fifty ships under Varius, the general sent to him by Sertorius, and Alexander the Paphlagonian, and Dionysius the eunuch. He sailed with the bulk of his forces for Nicomedia. A storm came up in which many of both divisions perished. When Lucullus had accomplished this result on land by starving his enemies, he collected a fleet from the Asiatic province and distributed it to the general serving under him. Triarius sailed to Apamea, captured it, and slew a great many of the inhabitants who had taken refuge in the temples. Barba took Prusius, situated at the base of a mountain, and occupied Nicaea, which had been abandoned by the Mithridatic garrison. At the harbor of the Achaeans, Lucullus captured thirteen of the enemy's ships. He overtook Varius and Alexander and Dionysius on a barren island near Lemnos, where the altar of Philoctetes is shown with the brazen serpent, the bows, and the breastplate bound with fillets, to remind us of the sufferings of that hero, and dashed at them in a contemptuous manner. They stoutly held their ground, he checked his oarsmen, and sent his ships towards them by twos in order to entice them out to sea. As they declined the challenge, but continued to defend themselves on land, he sent a part of his fleet around to another side of the island, disembarked a force of infantry, and drove the enemy to their ships. Still, they did not venture out to sea, but hugged the shore, because they were afraid of the army of Lucullus. Thus they were exposed to missiles on both sides, landward and seaward, and received a great many wounds, and after a heavy slaughter, took to flight. Varius, Alexander, and Dionysius the eunuch were captured in a cave where they had concealed themselves. Dionysius drank poison which he had with him and immediately expired. Lugellus gave orders that Varius be put to death, since he did not want to have his triumph graced by a Roman senator, but he kept Alexander for that purpose. Lucullus sent letters wreathed with laurel to Rome, as is the custom of victors, and then pressed forward to Bithynia. As Mithridates was sailing to Pontus, a second tempest overtook him, and he lost about ten thousand men and sixty ships, and the remainder were scattered however the wind blew them. His own ship sprang a leak, and he went aboard a small piratical craft, although his friends tried to dissuade him. The pirates landed him safely at Sinope. From that place he was towed to Amesis, whence he sent appeals to his son-in-law, Tigranes, the Armenian, and his son, Macaris, the rule of the Cimmerian Bosphorus, that they should hasten to his assistance. He ordered Diocles to take a large quantity of gold and other presents to the neighboring Scythians, but Diocles took the gold and the presents and deserted to Lucullus. Lucullus moved to the front with the prestige of victory, subduing everything in his path and subsisting on the country. Presently he came to a rich district, exempt from the ravages of war, where a slave was sold for four drachmas, an ox for one, and goats, sheep, clothing, and other things in proportion. Lucullus laid siege to Amissus and also to Eupatoria, which Mithridates had built alongside of Amissus, and named after himself, and where he had fixed the royal residence. With another army, Lucullus besieged Themyscira, which is named after one of the Amazons, and is situated on the river Thermodon. The besiegers of this place brought up towers, built mounds, and dug tunnels so large that the great subterranean battles could be fought in them. The inhabitants cut openings into these tunnels from above and thrust bears and other wild animals and swarm of bees into them against the workers. 
Those who were besieging Amissus suffered in other ways. The inhabitants repelled them bravely, made frequent sallies, and often challenged them to single combat. Mithridates sent them plenty of supplies and arms and soldiers from Kabira, where he wintered and collected a new army. Here he brought together about 40,000 foot and 4,000 horse. When spring came, Lucullus marched over the mountains against Mithridates, who had stationed advanced posts to hinder his approach, and to start signal fires whenever anything important should happen. He appointed a member of the royal family, named Phoenix, commander of this advance guard. When Lucullus drew near, Phoenix gave the fire signal to Mithridates and then deserted to Lucullus with his forces. Lucullus now passed over the mountains without difficulty and came down to Kabira, but was beaten by Mithridates in a cavalry engagement and retreated again to the mountain. Pomponius, his master of horse, was wounded and taken prisoner and brought to the presence of Mithridates. The king asked him what favor Pomponius could render him for sparing his life. Pomponius replied, A great one, if you make peace with Lucullus, but if you continue his enemy, I will not even consider your question. The barbarians wanted to put him to death, but the king said that he would not do violence to bravery overtaken by misfortune. He drew out his forces for battle several days in succession, but Lucullus would not come down and fight, so he looked about for some way to come at him by ascending the mountain. At this juncture, a Scythian named Okaba, who had deserted to Lucullus some time before and had saved the lives of many in the recent cavalry fight, and for that reason was deemed worthy to share Lucullus' table, his confidence, and his secrets, came to his tent while he was taking his noonday rest and tried to force his way in. He was wearing a short dagger in his belt, as was his custom. When he was prevented from entering, he became angry and said that there was a pressing necessity that the general should be aroused. The servants replied that there was nothing more useful to Lucullus than his safety. Thereupon the Scythian mounted his horse and went immediately to Mithridates, either because he had plotted against Lucullus and now thought that he was suspected, or because he considered himself insulted and was angry on this account. He exposed to Mithridates another Scythian named Sobdacus, who was about to desert to Lucullus. Sobdacus was accordingly arrested. Lucullus hesitated about going down directly to the plain, since the enemy was so much superior in horse, nor could he discover any way around, but he found a hunter in a cave who was familiar with the mountain paths. With him for a guide, he made a circuitous descent by rugged paths over Mithridates' head. He avoided the plain on account of the cavalry, and came down and chose a place for his camp, where he had a mountain stream on his front. As he was short of supplies, he sent to Cappadocia for corn, and in the meantime had frequent skirmishes with the enemy. Once, when the royal forces were put to flight, Mithridates came running to them from his camp, and, with reproachful words, rallied them to such good purpose that the Romans became terrified in turn, and fled up to the mountainside with such swiftness that they didn't know for a long time that the hostile force had desisted from the pursuit but each one thought that the fleeing comrade behind him was an enemy. So great was the panic that had overtaken them. Mithridates sent bulletins everywhere announcing this victory. He then sent a detachment composed of the bravest of his horse to intercept the convoy that was bringing supplies from Cappadocia to Lucullus, hoping to bring upon him the same scarcity of provisions from which he himself suffered at Cyzicus. It was his great object to cut off Lucullus' supplies, which were drawn from Cappadocia alone. But when his cavalry came upon the advance guard of the convoy in a narrow defile, they did not wait till their enemies had reached the open country. Consequently, their horses were useless in the narrow space, where the Romans hastily put themselves in line of battle across the road. Aided as foot soldiers would naturally be, by the difficulties of the ground, they killed some of the king's troops, drove others over precipices, and scattered the rest in flight. A few of them arrived at their camp by night and said that they were the only survivors, so that the rumor magnified the calamity which was indeed sufficiently great. Mithridates heard of this affair before Lucullus did, and he expected that Lucullus would take the advantage of so great a slaughter of his horsemen to attack him forthwith. Accordingly he fell into a panic and contemplated flight, and at once communicated his purpose to his friends in his tent. They did not wait for the signal to be given, but while it was still night, each one sent his own baggage out of the camp, which made a great crush of pack animals around the gates. 
When the soldiers perceived the commotion and saw what the baggage carriers were doing, they imagined every sort of absurdity. Filled with terror, mingled with anger, that the signal had not been given to them also, they demolished and ran over their own fortification and scattered in every direction over the plain, helter-skelter, without orders from the commanding general or any other officer. When Mithridates heard the disorderly rush, he dashed out of his tent among them and attempted to say something, but nobody would listen to him. He was caught in the crowd and knocked from his horse, but remounted and was borne to the mountains with a few followers. When Lucullus heard of the success of his provision train and observed the enemy's flight, he sent out a large force of cavalry in pursuit of the fugitives. Those who were still collecting baggage in the camp he surrounded with his infantry, whom he ordered for the time to abstain from plunder, but to kill indiscriminately. But the soldiers, seeing vessels of gold and of silver in abundance and much costly clothing, disregarded the order. Those who overtook Mithridates himself cut open the pack saddle of a mule that was loaded with gold, which fell out, and while they were busy with it, they allowed him to escape to Camona. From thence he fled to Tigranes, with two thousand horsemen. Tigranes did not admit him to his presence, but ordered that royal entertainment be provided for him on his estates. Mithridates, in utter despair of his kingdom, sent the eunuch Bacchus to his palace to put his sisters, wives, and concubines to death as he could. These, with wonderful devotion, destroyed themselves with daggers, poison, and ropes. When the garrison commanders of Mithridates saw these things, they went over to Lucullus in crowds, all but few. Lucullus marched among the others and regulated them. He also sent his fleet among the cities on the Pontic coast and captured Amastris, Heraclea, and some others. Sinope continued to resist him vigorously, and the inhabitants fought him on the water not without success. But when they were besieged, they burned their heavier ships, embarked on the lighter ones, and went away. Lucullus at once made it a free city, being moved thereto by the following dream. It is said that Autolycus, the companion of Heracles, in his expedition against the Amazons, was driven by a tempest into Sinope, and made himself master of the place, and that his consecrated statue gave oracles to the Sinopeans. As they were hastening their flight, they could not embark it on shipboard, but wrapped it up with linen cloths and ropes. Nobody told Lucullus of this beforehand, and he knew nothing about it. But he dreamed that he saw Autolycus calling him, and the following day, when some men passed him carrying the image wrapped up, he ordered them to take off the covering, and when he saw what he thought he had seen in the night, this was the kind of dream he had. After Sinope, Lucullus restored to their homes the citizens of Amissus, who had fled by sea in like manner because he learned that they had been settled there by Athens, when she held the empire of the sea. That they had a democratic form of government, at first and afterward, had been subject for a long time to the kings of Persia, that their democracy had been restored to them by the decree of Alexander, and that they had finally been compelled to serve the kings of Pontus. Lucullus sympathized with them, and in emulation of the favor shown to the Attic race by Alexander, he gave the city its freedom and recalled the citizens with all haste. Thus did Lucullus desolate and repeople both Sinope and Amissus. He entered into friendly relations with Macaris, the son of Mithridates and ruler of the Bosphorus, who sent him a crown of gold. He demanded the surrender of Mithridates from Tigranes, then he went back to the province of Asia. When the installment of tribute imposed by Sulla became due, he levied upon one-fourth of the harvest and imposed a house tax and a slave tax. He offered a triumphal sacrifice to the gods for the successful termination of the war. After the sacrifices had been performed, he marched with the two legions and five hundred horse against Tigranes, who had refused to surrender Mithridates to him. Lucullus crossed the Euphrates, but he required the barbarians, through whose territory he passed, to furnish only necessary supplies, since they did not want to fight, or to expose themselves to suffering by taking sides in the quarrel between Lucullus and Tigranes. No one told Tigranes that Lucullus was advancing, for the first man who brought this news he hanged, considering him a disturber of the good order of the cities. When he learned that it was true, he sent Mithrobazanes forward with two thousand horse to hinder Lucullus's march. He entrusted to Mancaeus the defense of Tigranocerta, 
which city, as I have already said, the king had built in this region in honor of himself, and to which he had summoned the principal inhabitants of the country under the penalty of confiscation of all their goods that they did not transfer to it. He surrounded with walls twenty-five meters high, and wide enough to contain stables for horses. In the suburbs he built a palace and laid out large parks, enclosures for wild animals, and fish ponds. He also erected a strong tower nearby. All these he put in charge of Mancaeus, and then he went through the country to collect an army. Lucullus, at his first encounter with Mithrobazanes, defeated him and put him to flight. Sextilius shut up Mancaeus into Granocurta, plundered the palace outside the walls, drew a ditch around the city and tower, moved machines against him, and undermined the wall. While Sextilius was doing this, Tigranes brought together some 250,000 foot and 50,000 horse. He sent about 6,000 of the latter to Tigranocurta, who broke through the Roman line to the tower, and seized and brought away the king's concubines. With the rest of his army, Tigranes marched against Lucullus. Mithridates, who was now for the first time admitted to his presence, advised him not to come to close quarters with the Romans but to circle around them with his horse only, to devastate the country and reduce them by famine if possible, in the same way that he had been served by Lucullus at Cyzicus, where he lost his army without fighting. Tigranes derided such generalship and advanced and made preparations for battle. When he saw how small the Roman force was, he said jestingly, If they are here as ambassadors, they are too many. If as enemies, altogether too few. Lucullus saw a hill favorably situated in the rear of Tigranes. He pushed his horse forward from his own front to worry the enemy, and draw them upon himself, retiring as they came up, so that the barbarians should break their own ranks in the pursuit. Then he sent his own infantry around to the hill and took possession of it unobserved. When he saw the enemy pursuing as though they had won the fight, and scattered in all directions, with the entire baggage train lying at the foot of the hill, he exclaimed, Soldiers, we are victorious, and dashed first upon their baggage carriers. These immediately fled in confusion and ran against their own infantry, and the infantry against the cavalry. Presently the rout was complete. Those who had been drawn a long distance in pursuit of the Roman horse, the latter turned upon and destroyed. The baggage train came into a collision with others tumultuously, they were all packed together in such a crowd that nobody could see clearly from what quarter their discomfiture proceeded. There was a great slaughter. Nobody stopped to plunder, for Lucullus had forbidden it with threats of punishment, so that they passed by bracelets and necklaces on the road, and continued killing for a distance of twenty kilometers until nightfall. Then they betook themselves to plunder with the permission of Lucullus. When Mancaeus beheld this defeat from Tigranocurta, he disarmed all of his Greek mercenaries because he suspected them. They, in fear of arrest, walked abroad or rested only in a body, and with clubs in their hands. Mancaeus set upon them with his armed barbarians. They wound their clothing around their left arms to serve as shields, and fought their assailants courageously, killed some, and shared their arms with each other. When they were sufficiently provided with weapons, they seized some of the towers, called to the Romans outside, and admitted them when they came up. In this way was Tigranocurta taken, and the immense wealth, appertaining to a newly built and nobly peopled city, plundered. Now Tigranes and Mithridates traversed the country collecting a new army, the command of which was committed to Mithridates, because Tigranes thought that his disasters must have taught him some lessons. They also sent messengers to Parthia to solicit aid from that quarter. Lucullus sent opposing legates, asking that the Parthians should either help him or remain neutral. Their king made secret agreements with both, but was in no haste to help either of them. Mithridates manufactured arms in every town. The soldiers he recruited were almost wholly Armenians. From these he selected the bravest to the number of about 70,000 foot, and half that number of horse, and dismissed the rest. He divided them into companies and cohorts, as nearly as possible, according to the Italian system, and turned them over to Pontic officers to be trained. When Lucullus moved toward them, Mithridates, with all the foot soldiers and a part of the horse, held his forces together on a hill. 
Tigranes, with the rest of the Horus, attacked the Roman foragers and was beaten, for which reason the Romans foraged more freely afterward, even in the vicinity of Mithridates himself, and encamped near him. Again, a great dust arose, indicating the approach of Tigranes. The two kings had resolved to surround Lucullus. The latter perceived their movement and sent forward the best of his horse to engage Tigranes at as great a distance as possible, and prevent him from deploying from his line of march into order of battle. He also challenged Mithridates to fight. He began to surround him with a ditch, but could not draw him out. Finally, winter came on and interrupted the work on both sides. Tigranes now withdrew into the interior of Armenia, and Mithridates hastened to what was left of his own kingdom of Pontus, taking with him 4,000 of his own troops and as many more that he had received from Tigranes. Lucullus slowly followed him, but was obliged to turn back frequently for want of provisions. Mithridates made haste and attacked Fabius, who had been left in command by Lucullus, put him to flight and killed 500 of his men. Fabius freed the slaves who had been in his camp and fought again an entire day, but the battle was going against him until Mithridates was struck by a stone on the knee and wounded by a dart under the eye, and was hastily carried out of the fight. For many days thereafter his forces were alarmed for his safety, and the Romans were quiet on account of the great number of wounds they had received. Mithridates was cured by the Agari, a Scythian tribe who make use of the poison of serpents as remedies. Some of this tribe always accompany the king as physicians. Triarius, the other general of Lucullus, now came with his own army to the assistance of Fabius, and received from the latter his forces and authority. He and Mithridates not long afterward joined battle, during which a tempest of wind, the like of which had not been known in the memory of man, tore down the tents of both, swept away their beasts of burden, and even dashed some of their men over precipices. Both sides then retreated. News having been received that Lucullus was coming, Triarius hastened to anticipate his action and made a night attack upon the outposts of Mithridates. The fight continued for a long time, doubtful, until the king made a powerful charge on that division of the enemy that was opposed to him and decided the battle. He broke through their ranks and drove their infantry into a muddy trench, where they were unable to stand and were slaughtered. He pursued their horse over the plain and made the most spirited use of the stroke of good luck, until a certain Roman centurion, who was riding with him in the guise of an attendant, gave him a severe wound with a sword in the thigh, as he could not expect to pierce his back through his corslet. Those who were near immediately cut the centurion in pieces. Mithridates was carried to the rear, and his friends recalled the army, by a hasty signal, from their splendid victory. Confusion befell them by reason of the unexpectedness of the signal, and fear lest some disaster had happened elsewhere. When they learned what it was, they gathered around the person of the king on the plain in consternation, until Timotheus, his physician, had stanched the blood and lifted the king up so that he could be seen. In like manner, in India, when Alexander was cured, he showed himself on a ship to the Macedonians, who were alarmed about him. As soon as Mithridates came to himself, he reproved those who had recalled the army from the fight, and led his men again the same day against the camp of the Romans. But they had already fled from it in terror. In stripping the dead, there he found twenty-four tribunes and a hundred and fifty centurions. So great a number of officers had seldom fallen in any single Roman defeat. Mithridates withdrew into the country which the Romans now call Lesser Armenia taking all the provisions he could and spoiling what he could not carry, so as to prevent Lucullus from getting any on his march. At this juncture a certain Roman of senatorial rank, named Atidius, a fugitive from justice, who had been with Mithridates a long time and had enjoyed his friendship, was detected in a conspiracy against him. The king condemned him to death, but not to torture, because he had once been a Roman senator. His fellow conspirators were subjected to dreadful tortures. The freedmen, who were cognizant of the designs of Atidius, he dismissed unharmed, because they were under obligations to their patron. When Lucullus was already encamped near Mithridates, the proconsul of Asia sent heralds to proclaim that Rome had accused Lucullus of unnecessarily prolonging the war, and had ordered that the soldiers under him be dismissed, 
and that the property of those who did not obey this order should be confiscated. When this information was received, the army disbanded at once, all but a few who remained with Lucullus because they were very poor and did not fear the penalty. So it turned out that the Mithridatic War under Lucullus came to no fixed and definite conclusion. The Romans, torn by revolts in Italy and threatened with famine by pirates on the sea, considered it inopportune to undertake another war of this magnitude until their present troubles were ended. When Mithridates perceived this, he again invaded Cappadocia and fortified his own kingdom. The Romans overlooked these transactions while they were clearing the sea. When this was accomplished, and while Pompey, the destroyer of the pirates, was still in Asia, the Mithridatic War was at once resumed, and the command of it given to Pompey. Since the campaign at sea was part of the operations under his command, which was begun before his Mithridatic War, and has not found proper mention elsewhere in my history, it seems well to introduce it here, and to run over the events as they occurred. When Mithridates first went to war with the Romans, and subdued the province of Asia, Sulla being then in difficulties respecting Greece, he thought that he should not hold the province long, and accordingly plundered it in all sorts of ways, as I have mentioned above, and sent out pirates on the sea. In the beginning they prowled around with a few small boats, worrying the inhabitants like robbers. As the war lengthened they became more numerous and navigated larger ships, relishing their large gains. They did not desist when Mithridates was defeated, made peace, and retired. Having lost both livelihood and country by reason of the war and fallen into extreme destitution, they harvested the sea instead of the land, at first with pinnacles and hemioli, then with two banked and three banked ships, sailing in squadrons under pirate chiefs, who were like generals of an army. They fell upon unfortified towns, they undermined or battered down the walls of others, or captured them by regular siege and plundered them. They carried off the wealthier citizens to their haven of refuge and held them for ransom. They scorned the name of robbers and called their takings the prize of warfare. They had artisans chained to their tasks and were continually bringing in materials of timber, brass, and iron. Being elated by their gains and determined not to change their mode of life, yet they likened themselves to kings tyrants and great armies, and thought that if they should all come together in the same place, they would be invincible. They built ships and made all kinds of arms. Their chief seat was at a place called the Crags in Kilikia, which they had chosen as their common anchorage and encampment. They had castles and towers and desert islands and retreats everywhere. They chose for their principal rendezvous the coast of Kilikia, where it was rough and harborless and rose in high mountain peaks for which reason they were all called by the common name of Kilikians. Perhaps this evil had its beginning among the men of the crags of Kilikia, but thither also men of Syrian, Cyprian, Pamphylian, and Pontic origin, and those of almost all the eastern nations had congregated, who, on account of the long continuance of the Mithridatic War, preferred to do wrong rather than to suffer it, and for this purpose chose the sea instead of the land. Thus, in a very short time, they increased in numbers to tens of thousands. They dominated now not only the eastern waters, but the whole Mediterranean to the pillars of Hercules. They vanquished some of the Roman praetors in naval engagements, and among others, the praetor of Sicily on the Sicilian coast itself. No sea could be navigated in safety, and land remained untilled for want of commercial intercourse. The city of Rome felt this evil most keenly, her subjects being distressed and herself suffering grievously from hunger by reason of her very greatness. It appeared to them to be a great and difficult task to destroy so large a force of seafaring men scattered everywhere on land and sea, and so nimble a flight, sailing out from no particular country or any known places, having no habitation or anything of their own, but only what they might chance to light upon. Thus, both the greatness and the unexampled nature of this war, which was subject to no laws and had nothing tangible or visible about it, caused perplexity and fear on all sides. Murena had attacked them, but accomplished nothing worth mentioning, nor had Servilius Isaricus, who succeeded him. And now the pirates contemptuously assailed the coasts of Italy, around Brudisium, Etruria, 
and seized and carried off some women of noble families who were traveling, and also two praetors with their very insignia of office. When the Romans could no longer endure the damage and disgrace, they made Gnaeus Pompey, who was then their man of greatest reputation, commander by law for three years, with absolute power over the whole sea within the pillars of Hercules and of the land for a distance of 75 kilometers from the coast. They sent letters to all kings, rulers, peoples, and cities that they should aid Pompey in all ways. They gave him power to raise troops and to collect money from the provinces, and they furnished a large army from their own enrollment, and all the ships they had, and money to the amount of 6,000 Attic talents. So great and difficult did they consider the task of overcoming such great forces, dispersed over so wide a sea, hiding easily in so many nooks, retreating quickly and darting out again unexpectedly. Never did any man before Pompey set forth with so great authority conferred upon him by the Romans. Presently he had an army of a hundred and twenty thousand foot and four thousand horse and two hundred and seventy ships, including Hemioli. He had twenty-five assistants of senatorial rank, whom they called lieutenant generals, among whom he divided the sea, giving ships, cavalry, and infantry to each, and investing them with the insignia of praetors, in order that each one might have absolute authority over the part entrusted to him, while he, Pompey, like a king of kings, should course among them to see that they remained where they were stationed, lest, while he was pursuing the pirates in one place, he should be drawn to something else before his work was finished, and so that there might be forces to encounter them everywhere and to prevent them from forming junctions with each other. Pompey disposed of the whole in the following manner. He put Tiberius Nero and Manlius Torquatus in command of Spain and the Straits of Hercules. He assigned Marcus Pomponius to the Gallic and Ligurian waters. Africa, Sardinia, Corsica, and the neighboring islands were committed to Lentulus Marcellinus and Publius Attilius, and the coast of Italy itself to Lucius Gellius and Gnaeus Lentulus. Sicily and the Adriatic, as far as Acarnania, were assigned to Plautius Varus and Terentius Varro. The Peloponnese, Attica, Eubea, Thessaly, Macedonia, and Boeotia to Lucius Asena. The Greek islands, the whole Aegean Sea, and the Hellespont, in addition, to Lucius Lollius, Bithynia, Thrace, the Propontis, and the mouth of the Euxine, to Publius Piso, Lycia, Pamphylia, Cyprus, and Phoenicia, to Metellus Nepos. Thus were the commands of the praetors arranged for the purpose of attacking, defending, and guarding their respective assignments, so that each might catch the pirates, put to flight by others, and not be drawn a long distance from their own station by the pursuit, nor carried round and round as in a race, and the time for doing the work protracted. Pompey himself made a tour of the whole. He first inspected the western stations, accomplishing the task in forty days, and passing through Rome on his return. Thence he went to Brudisium, and, proceeding from this place, he occupied an equal time in visiting the eastern stations. He astonished all by the rapidity of his movement, the magnitude of his preparations, and his formidable reputation, so that the pirates, who had expected to attack him first, or at least to show that the task he had undertaken against them was no easy one, became straightway alarmed, abandoned their assaults upon the towns they were besieging, and fled to their accustomed citadels and inlets. Thus the sea was cleared by Pompey forthwith and without a fight and the pirates were everywhere subdued by the praetors at their several stations. Pompey himself hastened to Kilikia with forces of various kinds, and many engines, as he expected that there would be need of every kind of fighting and every kind of siege against the rock-bound citadels. But he needed nothing. The terror of his name and the greatness of his preparations had produced a panic among the robbers. They hoped that if they did not resist, they might receive lenient treatment. First, those who held Cragus and Anticragus, their largest citadels, surrendered themselves, and after them the mountaineers of Kilikia, and finally all one after another. They gave up at the same time a great quantity of arms, some completed, others in the workshops. Also their ships, some still on the rocks, others already afloat. Also brass and iron collected for building them, 
and sailcloth, rope, and various kinds of materials, and finally a multitude of captives either held for ransom or chained to their tasks. Pompey burned the materials, carried away the ships, and sent the captives back to their respective countries. Many of them there found their own kenotaphs, for they were supposed to be dead. Those pirates who had evidently fallen into this way of life, not from wickedness but from poverty consequent upon the war, Pompey settled in Malus, Adana, and Epiphania, or any other uninhabited or thinly peopled town in rough Kilikia. Some of them he sent to Dime in Achaia. Thus the war against the pirates, which it was supposed would prove very difficult, was brought to an end by Pompey in a few days. He took 71 ships by capture and 306 by surrender from the pirates, and 120 of their towns, castles, and other places of rendezvous. About 10,000 of the pirates were slain in battles. For this victory, so swiftly and unexpectedly gained, the Romans extolled Pompey beyond measure. And while he was still in Kilikia, they chose him commander of the war against Mithridates, giving him the same unlimited powers as before, to make war and peace as he liked, and to proclaim nations, friends, or enemies according to his own judgment. They gave him command of all the forces beyond the borders of Italy. All these powers had never been given to anyone general before. This was perhaps the reason why they gave him the title of Pompey the Great, for the Mithridatic War had been successfully prosecuted by other generals before him. He accordingly collected his army and marched to the territory of Mithridates. The latter had an army selected from his own forces, of 30,000 foot and 3,000 horse, stationed on his frontier. But since Lucullus had lately devastated that region, there was a scant supply of provisions, and for this reason many of his men deserted. The deserters whom he caught he crucified, or put out their eyes, or burned them alive. But while the fear of punishment lessened the number of deserters, the scarcity of provisions weakened him. Mithridates sent envoys to Pompey asking on what terms he could obtain peace. Pompey replied, By delivering up our deserters and surrendering at discretion. When Mithridates was made acquainted with these terms, he communicated them to the deserters. And when he observed their consternation, he swore that on account of the cupidity of the Romans, he would never make peace with them, nor would he give up anybody to them, nor would he ever do anything that was not for the common advantage of all. So spoke Mithridates. Then Pompey placed a cavalry force in ambush, and sent forward others to harass the king's outposts openly, and ordered them to provoke the enemy and then retreat, as though vanquished. This was done until those in ambush took their enemy in the rear and put them to flight. The Romans might have broken into the enemy's camp along with the fugitives had not the king, apprehending this danger, led forward his infantry. Then the Romans retired. This was the result of the first trial of arms and cavalry engagement between Pompey and Mithridates. The king, being short of provisions, retreated reluctantly and allowed Pompey to enter his territory, expecting that he also would suffer from scarcity when encamped in the devastated region. But Pompey had managed to have his supply sent after him. He passed around to the eastward of Mithridates, established a series of fortified posts and camps extending a distance of 25 kilometers, and drew a line of circumvallation around him which made foraging still more difficult for him. The king did not oppose this work, being either afraid or mentally paralyzed, as often happens on the approach of calamity. Being again pressed for supplies, he slaughtered his pack animals, keeping only his horses. When he had scarcely fifty days' provisions left, he fled by night, in profound silence by bad roads. Pompey overtook him with difficulty in the daytime and assailed his rear guard. The king's friends then urged him to prepare for battle, but he would not fight. He merely drove back the assailants with his horse and retired into the thick woods in the evening. The following day he took up a strong position defended by rocks, to which there was access by only one road, which he held with an advance guard of four cohorts. The Romans put an opposing force on guard there to prevent Mithridates from escaping. At daybreak, both commanders put their forces under arms. The outposts began skirmishing along the defile, and some of the king's horsemen, without their horses and without orders, went to the assistance of their advance guard. 
A large number of the Roman cavalry came up against them, and the horseless Mithridatians rushed back to their camp to mount their horses, and thus to make themselves a more equal match for the advancing Romans. When those who were still arming on the higher ground looked down and saw their own men running toward them with haste and outcries, but did not know the reason, they thought that they had been put to flight. They threw down their arms and fled as though their camp had already been captured on the other side. As there was no road out of place, they fell foul of each other in the confusion, until finally they leaped down the precipices. Thus the army of Mithridates perished through the rashness of those who caused a panic by going to the assistance of the advance guard without orders. The remainder of Pompey's task was easy, in the way of killing and capturing men not yet armed and shut up in a rocky defile. About 10,000 were slain, and the camp with all its apparatus was taken. Mithridates made his escape through the cliffs with his attendants only and fled. He fell in with a troop of mercenary horse and about 3,000 foot who accompanied him directly to the castle of Simorex, where he had accumulated a large sum of money. Here he gave rewards and a year's pay to those who had fled with him. Taking 6,000 talents, he hastened to the headwaters of the Euphrates, intending to proceed thence to Colchis. As his march was uninterrupted, he crossed the Euphrates on the fourth day. Three days later, he put in order and armed the forces that had accompanied or joined him, and entered Cotene in Armenia. There the Cotenians and Iberians tried with darts and slings to prevent him from coming in, but he advanced and proceeded to the river Apsarus. Some people think that the Iberians of Asia were the ancestors of the Iberians of Europe. Others think that the former emigrated from the latter. Still others think they merely have the same name, as their customs and languages are not similar. Mithridates wintered at Dioscurius in Colchis, which city, the Colchians think, preserves the remembrance of the sojourn there of the Dioscuri, Castor and Pollux, with the Argonautic expedition. Mithridates here made no small plans, nor yet plans suitable for a fugitive, but conceived the idea of making the circuit of the whole Pontic coast, passing from Pontus to the Scythians around the Sea of Azov, and thus arriving at the Bosphorus. He intended to take away the kingdom of Machares, his ungrateful son, and confront the Romans once more, wage war against them from the side of Europe while they were in Asia, and to put between them as a dividing line the strait, which is believed to have been called the Bosphorus because Io swam across it when she was changed into a cow and fled from the jealousy of Hera. Such was the chimerical undertakings that Mithridates now set about. He imagined, nevertheless, that he should accomplish it. He pushed on through strange and warlike Scythian tribes, partly by permission, partly by force, for although a fugitive and in misfortune, he was still respected and feared. He passed through the country of the Henioki, who received him willingly. The Achaeans, who resisted him, he put to flight. These, it is said, when returning from the siege of Troy, were driven by a storm into the Euxine Sea and underwent great sufferings there at the hands of the barbarians, because they were Greeks. And when they sent to their home for ships, and their request was disregarded, they conceived such a hatred for the Greek race, that whenever they captured any Greeks, they emulated them, Scythian fashion. At first, in their anger, they served all in this way, afterwards only the handsomest ones, and finally a few chosen by lot. So much for the Achaeans of Scythia. Mithridates finally reached the Azov country, of which there were many princes, all of whom received him, escorted him, and exchanged presents with him on account of the fame of his deeds, his empire, and his power, which were still not to be despised. He formed alliances with them in contemplation of other and more novel exploits, such as marching through Thrace to Macedonia, through Macedonia to Pannonia, and passing over the Alps into Italy, with the more powerful of these princes, he cemented the alliance by giving his daughters in marriage. When his son Macaris learned that he had made such a journey in so short a time among savage tribes, and through the Scythian gates, which had never been passed by anyone before, he sent envoys to him to defend himself, saying that he was under the necessity of conciliating the Romans. But, knowing his father's inexorable temper, he fled to the Pontic Cursonessus, burning the ships to prevent his father from pursuing him. When the latter procured other ships and sent them after him, he anticipated his fate by killing himself.
Mithridates put to death all of his own friends whom he had left here in places of authority when he went away. But those of his son he dismissed unharmed, as they had acted under the obligations of private friendship. This was the state of things with Mithridates. Pompey pursued Mithridates in his flight as far as Colchis, but he thought that his foe would never get around to Pontus or to the Sea of Azov, or undertake anything great even if he should escape. He advanced to Colchis in order to gain knowledge of the country visited by the Argonauts, Castor and Pollux, and Heracles, and especially he desired to see the place where they say that Prometheus was fastened to Mount Caucasus. Many streams issue from Caucasus, bearing gold dust so fine as to be invisible. The inhabitants put sheepskins with shaggy fleece into the stream, and thus collect the floating particles. Perhaps the golden fleece of Ites was of this kind. All the neighboring tribes accompanied Pompey on his exploring expedition. Only Orosis, king of the Albanians, and Artokes, king of the Iberians, placed 70,000 men in ambush for him at the river Cyrus which empties into the Caspian Sea by twelve navigable mouths, receiving the waters of several large streams, the greatest of which is the Araxes. Pompey, gaining knowledge of the ambush, bridged the river and drove the barbarians into a dense forest. These people are terrible forest fighters, hiding in the woods and darting out unexpectedly. Pompey surrounded this forest with an army, set it on fire, and pursued the fugitives when they ran out until they all surrendered and brought him hostages and presents. Pompey was afterward awarded one of his triumphs at Rome for these exploits. Among the hostages and prisoners, many women were found, who had suffered wounds no less than the men. These were supposed to be Amazons, but whether the Amazons are a neighboring nation, who were called to their aid at the time, or whether certain warlike women are called Amazons by the barbarians there, it is not known. On his return from that quarter, Pompey marched against Armenia, making it a cause of war against Tigranes that he had assisted Mithridates. He was now not far from the royal residence, Artaxata. Tigranes was resolved to fight no longer. He had had three sons by the daughter of Mithridates, two of whom he had himself killed, one in battle, where the son was fighting against the father, and the other in the hunting field because he had neglected to assist his father who had been thrown, but had put the diadem on his own head while the father was lying on the ground. The third one, whose name was Tigranes, had seemed too much distressed by his father's hunting accident and had received a crown from him, but nevertheless he also deserted him after a short interval, waged war against him, was defeated, and fled to Phraites, king of the Parthians, who had lately succeeded his father Cintricus in the government of that country. As Pompey drew near, this young Tigranes, after communicating his attentions to Phraates and receiving his approval, for Phraates also desired Pompey's friendship, took refuge with Pompey as a suppliant, and this although he was a grandson of Mithridates. Pompey's reputation among the barbarians for justice and good faith was great. Tigranes, the father trusting to it, came to Pompey unheralded to submit all his affairs to the latter's decision and to make a complaint against his son. Pompey ordered tribunes and prefects of Horus to meet him on the road as an act of courtesy, but those who accompanied Tigranes feared to advance without the sanction of a herald and fled to the rear. Tigranes came forward, however, and prostrated himself before Pompey as his superior, in barbarian fashion. There are those who relate that he was led up by lictors when sent for by Pompey. However that may be, he came and made explanations of the past, and gave to Pompey for himself six thousand talents, and for the army fifty drachmas to each soldier, one thousand to each centurion, and ten thousand to each tribune. Pompey pardoned him for the past, reconciled him with his son, and decided that the latter should rule Sophene and Gordiane, which are now called Lesser Armenia, and the father the rest of Armenia, and that at his death the son should succeed him, and that also. He required that Tigranes should at once give up the territory that he had gained by war. Accordingly, he gave up the whole of Syria from the Euphrates to the sea, for he held that and a part of Cilicia, which he had taken from Antiochus, surnamed Pius. Those Armenians who deserted Tigranes on the road when he was going to Pompey because they were afraid, 
persuaded his son, who was still with Pompey, to make an attempt upon his father. Pompey seized him and put him in chains. As he still tried to stir up the Parthians against Pompey, he was led in the latter's triumph and afterward put to death. And now Pompey, thinking that the whole war was at an end, founded a city on that place where he had overcome Mithridates in battle, which is called Nicopolis, from that affair and is situated in Lesser Armenia. To Ariobarzanes he gave back the kingdom of Cappadocia, and added to it Sophene and Gordiane, which he had partitioned to the son of Tigranes, and which are now administered as parts of Cappadocia. He gave him also the city of Castabala, and some others in Kilikia. Ariobazanes entrusted his whole kingdom to his son, while he was still living. Many changes took place until the time of Caesar Augustus, under whom this kingdom, like many others, became a Roman province. Pompey then passed over Mount Taurus and made war against Antiochus, the king of Comagene, until the latter entered into friendly relations with him. He also fought against Darius the Mede and put him to flight, either because he had helped Antiochus or Tigranes before him. He made war against the Nabataean Arabs, whose king was Aretas, and against the Jews, whose king, Aristobulus, had revolted, until he had captured their holiest city, Jerusalem. He advanced against and brought under Roman rule without fighting those parts of Kilikia that were not yet subject to it, and the remainder of Syria which lies along the Euphrates, and the countries called Col Syria, Phoenicia, and Palestine, also Idumea and Iturea, and the other parts of Syria by whatever name called. Not that he had any complaint against Antiochus, the son of Antiochus Pius, who was present and asked for his paternal kingdom, but because he thought that, since he had disposed Tigranes, the conqueror of Antiochus, it belonged to the Romans by the law of war. While he was yet settling these affairs, ambassadors came to him from Phraates and Tigranes, who had gone to war with each other. Those of Tigranes asked the aid of Pompey as an ally, while those of the Parthian sought to secure for him the friendship of the Roman people. As Pompey did not think it best to fight the Parthians without a decree of the Senate, he sent mediators to compose their differences. While Pompey was about this business, Mithridates had completed his circuit of the Euxine and occupied Panticapaeum, a European market town at the outlet of the sea. There, at the Bosphorus, he put to death... Xipheres, one of his sons, on account of the following fault of his mother, Mithridates had a castle where, in a secret underground treasury, a great deal of money lay concealed in numerous iron-bound brazen vessels. Stratonike, one of the king's concubines, or wives, had been put in charge of the castle, and while he was still making his journey around the Euxine, she delivered it up to Pompey and revealed to him the secret treasures on the sole condition that he should spare her son, Xipheres, if he should capture him. Pompey took the money, and promised her that he would spare Xipheres, and allowed her to take away her own things. When Mithridates learned these facts, he killed Xipheres at the straits, while his mother was looking on from the opposite shore, and cast his body out unburied, thus wreaking his spite on the son in order to grieve the mother who had offended him, and now he sent ambassadors to Pompey, who was still in Syria and who did not know that the king was at the place. They promised that the king would pay tribute to the Romans if they would let him have his paternal kingdom. When Pompey required that Mithridates should come himself and make his petition as Tigranes had done, he said that as long as he was Mithridates he would never agree to that, but that he would send some of his sons and his friends to do so. Even while he was saying these things, he was levying an army of freedmen and slaves promiscuously, manufacturing arms, projectiles, and machines, helping himself to timber and killing plow oxen for the sake of their sinews. He levied tribute on all, even those of the slenderest means. His ministers made these exactions with harshness to many, without his knowledge, for he had fallen sick with ulcers on his face and allowed himself to be seen only by three eunuchs, who cured him. When he had recovered from his illness and his army was collected, 
It consisted of sixty picked cohorts of six thousand men, each and a great multitude of other troops, besides ships and strongholds that had been captured by his generals while he was sick. He sent a part of it across the strait to Phanagoria, another trading place at the mouth of the sea, in order to possess himself of the passage on either side while Pompey was still in Syria. Castor of Phanagoria, who had once been maltreated by Trypho, the king's eunuch, fell upon the ladder as he was entering the town, killed him, and summoned the citizens to revolt. Although the citadel was already held by Artaphernes and the other sons of Mithridates, the inhabitants piled wood around it and set it on fire, in consequence of which Artaphernes, Darius, Xerxes, and Oxothrys, sons, and Eupatra, a daughter of Mithridates, in fear of the fire, surrendered themselves and were led into captivity. Of these, Artaphernes alone was about forty years of age. The others were handsome children. Cleopatra, another daughter, resisted. Her father, in admiration of her courageous spirit, sent a number of rowboats and rescued her. All the neighboring castles that had been lately occupied by Mithridates now revolted from him in emulation of the Phanagorians namely Cursonessus, Theodosia, Nymphaeum, and others around the Euxine, which were well situated for the purposes of war. Mithridates, observing these frequent defections and having suspicions of the army itself, lest it should fail him because the service was compulsory and the taxes were heavy, and because the soldiers always lacked confidence in unlucky commanders, sent some of his daughters in charge of the eunuchs to be married to the Scythian princes, asking them at the same time to send him reinforcements as quickly as possible. Five hundred soldiers accompanied them from his own army. Soon after they left the presence of Mithridates, they killed the eunuchs who were leading them, for they always hated these persons, who were all powerful with Mithridates, and conducted the young women to Pompey. Although bereft of so many children and castles and of his whole kingdom, and in no way fit for war, and although he could not expect any aid from the Scythians, Still, no inferior position, none corresponding to his present misfortunes, even then found a place in his mind. He proposed to turn his course to the Gauls, whose friendship he had cultivated a long time for this purpose, and with them to invade Italy, hoping that many of the Italians themselves would join him on account of their hatred of the Romans, for he had heard that such had been Hannibal's policy after the Romans had waged war against him in Spain and that he had become in this way an object of the greatest terror to them. He knew that almost all of Italy had lately revolted from the Romans by reason of their hatred and had waged war against them for a very long time, and had sustained Spartacus, the gladiator, against them, though he was a man of no repute. Filled with these ideas, he was for hastening to the Gauls, but his soldiers, though the very bold enterprise might be attractive, were deterred chiefly by its magnitude, and by the long distance of the expedition in a foreign territory, against men whom they could not overcome even in their own country. They thought also that Mithridates, in utter despair, wanted to end his life in a valiant and kingly way, rather than in idleness. So they tolerated him and remained silent, for there was nothing mean or contemptible about him even in his misfortunes. While affairs were in this plight, Pharnaces, the son whom he was most fond of, and whom he had often designated as his successor, either alarmed about the expedition and the kingdom, for he still had hopes of pardon from the Romans, but reckoned that he should lose everything completely if his father should invade Italy, or spurred by other motives, formed a conspiracy against his father. His fellow conspirators were captured and put to the torture, but Menophanes persuaded the king that it would not be seemly just as he was starting on his expedition, to put to death the son who had been, until then, the dearest to him. People were liable to such turns, he said, in times of war, and when they came to an end, things quieted down again. In this way, Mithridates was persuaded to pardon his son, but the latter, still fearing his father's anger, and knowing that the army shrank from the expedition, went by night to the leading Roman deserters, who were encamped very near the king and by representing to them its true light, and, as they well knew it, the danger of their advancing against Italy, and by making them any promises that they refused to go, induced them to desert from his father. After Pharnaces had persuaded them, he sent emissaries the same night to other camps nearby and won them over. 
Early in the morning, the first deserters raised a shout, and those next to them repeated it. And so on. Even the naval force joined in the cry, not all of them having been advised beforehand, perhaps, but eager for a change, despising failure, and always ready to attach themselves to a new hope. Others, who were ignorant of the conspiracy, thought that all had been corrupted, and that if they remained alone, they would be scorned by the majority. And so, from fear and necessity, rather than inclination, joined in the shouting. Mithridates, being awakened by the noise, sent messengers out to inquire what the shouters wanted. The latter made no concealment, but said, We want your son to be king. We want a young man instead of an old one who was ruled by eunuchs, the slayer of so many of his sons, his generals, and his friends. When Mithridates heard this, he went out to reason with them. A part of his own guard then ran to join the deserters, but the latter refused to admit them unless they would do some irreparable deed as a proof of their fidelity, pointing at the same time to Mithridates. So they hastened to kill his horse, for he himself had fled, and at the same time saluted Pharnaces as king, as though the rebels were already victorious. And one of them brought a broad papyrus leaf from the temple and crowned him with it in place of a diadem. The king saw these things from a high portico, and he sent messenger after messenger to Pharnaces, asking permission to fly in safety. When none of his messengers returned, fearing lest he should be delivered up to the Romans, he praised the bodyguards and friends who had been faithful to him, and sent them to the new king. But the army killed some of them under a misapprehension as they were approaching. Mithridates then took out some poison that he always carried next to his sword, and mixed it. There, two of his daughters, who were still girls growing up together, named Mithridates and Nisa, who had been betrothed to the kings of Egypt and of Cyprus, asked him to let them have some of the poison first, and insisted strenuously and prevented him from taking it until they had taken some and swallowed it. The drug took effect on them at once. But upon Mithridates, although he walked around rapidly to hasten its action, it had no effect, because he had accustomed himself to other drugs by continually trying them as a means of protection against poisoners. These are still called the Mithridatic drugs. Seeing a certain Bituitus there, an officer of the Gauls, he said to him, I have profited much from your right arm against my enemies. I shall profit from it most of all if you will kill me, and save from the danger of being led in a Roman triumph one who has been an autocrat for so many years, and the ruler of so great a kingdom but who is now unable to die by poison because, like a fool, he has fortified himself against the poison of others. Although I have kept watch and ward against all the poisons that one takes with his food, I have not provided against that domestic poison, always the most dangerous to kings, the treachery of army, children, and friends. Bituitus, thus appealed to, rendered the king the service that he desired. So died Mithridates, who was the sixteenth in descent from Darius, the son of Hystaspes, king of the Persians, and the eighth from that Mithridates who left the Macedonians and acquired the kingdom of Pontus. He lived sixty-eight or sixty-nine years, and of these he reigned fifty-seven, for the kingdom came to him when he was an orphan. He subdued the neighboring barbarians and many of the Scythians, and waged a formidable war against the Romans for forty years, during which he frequently conquered Bithynia and Cappadocia, besides making incursions into the Roman province of Asia, and into Phrygia, Paphlagonia, Galatia, and Macedonia. He invaded Greece, where he performed many remarkable exploits, and ruled the sea from Cilicia to the Adriatic until Sulla confined him again to his paternal kingdom, after destroying a hundred and sixty thousand of his soldiers. Notwithstanding these great losses, he renewed the war without difficulty. He fought with the greatest generals of his time. He was vanquished by Sulla, Lucullus, and Pompey, although several times he got the better of them also. Lucius Cassius, Quintus Opius, and Manius Aquilius, he took prisoners and carried them around with him. The last he killed because he was the cause of the war. The others he surrendered to Sulla. He defeated Fimbria, Murena, the consul Cota, Fabius, and Triarius. He was always high-spirited and indomitable, even in misfortunes, 
Until finally overthrown, he left no avenue of attack against the Romans untried. He made alliances with the Samnites and the Gauls, and he sent legates to Sertorius in Spain. He was often wounded by his enemies and by conspirators, but he never desisted from anything on that account, even when he was an old man. None of the conspiracies ever escaped his detection, not even the last one, but he voluntarily overlooked it and perished in consequence of it. So ungrateful is the wickedness that has been once pardoned. He was bloodthirsty and cruel to all, the slayer of his mother, his brother, three sons, and three daughters. He had a large frame, as his armor, which he sent to Nemea and to Delphi, shows, and was so strong that he rode horseback and hurled a javelin to the last, and could ride 180 kilometers in one day, changing horses at intervals. He used to drive a chariot with 16 horses at once. He cultivated Greek learning, and thus became acquainted with the religious cult of Greece, and was fond of music. He was abstemious and patient of labor for the most part, and yielded only to pleasures with women. Such was the end of Mithridates, who bore the surnames of Eupator and Dionysus. When the Romans heard of his death, they held a festival because they were delivered from a troublesome enemy. Pharnake sent his father's corpse to Pompey at Senape in a trireme, together with the persons who captured Manius and many hostages, both Greek and barbarian, and asked that he should be allowed to rule either his paternal kingdom or the Bosphorus alone, which his brother Macaris had received from Mithridates. Pompey provided for the expenses of the funeral of Mithridates and directed his servants to give his remains a royal internment and to place them in the tombs of the kings in Sinope because he admired his great achievements, and considered him the first of the kings of his time. Pharnakes, for delivering Italy from much trouble, was inscribed as a friend and ally of the Romans, and was given Bosphorus as his kingdom, except Phanagoria, whose inhabitants were made free and independent, because they were the first to resist Mithridates when he was recovering his strength, collecting ships, creating a new army and military posts, and because they led others to revolt and were the cause of his final collapse. Pompey, having cleaned out the robber dens and prostrated the greatest king then living in one and in the same war, and having fought most successful battles besides those of the Pontic War with Colchians, Albanians, Iberians, Armenians, Medes, Arabs, Jews, and the other eastern nations, extended the Roman sway as far as Egypt. But he did not advance into Egypt, although the king of that country invited him there to suppress a sedition, and sent gifts to himself and money and clothing for his whole army. He either feared the greatness of this still prosperous kingdom, or wished to guard against the envy of his enemies, or the warning voice of oracles, or for other reasons which I will publish in my Egyptian history. He let some of the subjugated nations go free and made them allies. Others he placed at once under Roman rule, and others he distributed to kings. To Tigranes, Armenia. To Pharnakes, Bosphorus. To Ariobazanes, Cappadocia, and the other provinces before mentioned. To Antiochus of Comagene he turned over Seleucia and the parts of Mesopotamia that he conquered. He made the Otarus and the other tetrarchs of the Gallo-Grecians, who are now the Galatians, bordering on Cappadocia. He made Attalus prince of Paphlagonia, and Aristarchus prince of Colchis. He also appointed Archelaus to the priesthood of the goddess worshipped at Comana, which is a royal prerogative. Castor of Phanagoria was inscribed as a friend of the Roman people. Much territory and money were bestowed upon others. He founded cities also in Lesser Armenia, Nicopolis, named for his victory, in Pontus, Eupatoria, which Mithridates Eupator had built and named after himself, but destroyed because it had received the Romans. Pompey rebuilt it and named it Magnopolis. In Cappadocia he rebuilt Mazaka, which had been completely ruined by the war. He restored other towns in many places that had been destroyed or damaged, in Pontus, Palestine, Colossyria, and Kilikia, in which he had settled a great part of the pirates, and where the city formerly called Soli is now known as Pompeiopolis. The city of Talari Mithridates used as a storehouse of furniture. Here were found 2,000 drinking cups made of onyx welded with gold, and many cups, wine coolers, and drinking horns. Also ornamental couches and chairs, bridles for horses, and trappings for their breasts and shoulders, all ornamented in like manner with precious stones and gold. 
The quantity of this store was so great that the inventory of it occupied 30 days. Some of these things had been inherited from Darius, the son of Histaspes. Others came from the kingdom of the Ptolemies, having been deposited by Cleopatra at the island of Kos, and given by the inhabitants to Mithridates. Still others had been made or collected by Mithridates himself, as he was a lover of the beautiful in furniture, as well as in other things. At the end of the winter, Pompey distributed rewards to the army, 1,500 Attic drachmas to each soldier, and, in like proportion to the officers, the whole, it was said, amounting to 16,000 talents. Then he marched to Ephesus, embarked for Italy, and hastened to Rome having dismissed his soldiers at Brudusium to their homes, by which act his popularity was greatly increased among the Romans. As he approached the city, he was met by successive processions, first of youths farther from the city, then bands of men of different ages came out as far as they severally could walk. Last of all came the Senate, which was lost in wonder at his exploits, for no one had ever before vanquished so powerful an enemy, and at the same time brought so many great nations under subjection, and extended the Roman rule to the Euphrates. He was awarded a triumph exceeding in brilliancy any that had gone on before, being now only thirty-five years of age. It occupied two successive days, and many nations were represented in the procession, from Pontus, Armenia, Cappadocia, Cilicia, all the peoples of Syria, besides Albanians, Heniochi, Achaeans, Scythians, and Eastern Iberians. Seven hundred complete ships were brought into the harbor, in the triumphal procession were two horse carriages and litters laden with gold or with other ornaments of various kinds. Also the couch of Darius, the son of Histaspes, the throne and scepter of Mithridates Eupator himself and his image, four meters high, made of solid gold, and seventy-five million one hundred thousand drachmas of silver coin. The number of wagons carrying arms was infinite, and the number of the beaks of ships after these came the multitude of captives and pirates, none of them bound, but all arrayed in their native costumes. Before Pompey himself were led the satraps, sons, and generals of the kings against whom he fought, who were present, some having been captured and others given as hostages, to the number of 324. Among them were Tigranes, the son of Tigranes, and five sons of Mithridates, namely Artaphernes, Cyrus, Oxathres, Darius, and Xerxes, also his daughters, Orsabaris and Eupatra. Othakis, chief of the Cochians, was also led into the procession, and Aristobulus, king of the Jews, the tyrants of Cilicians, and the female rulers of the Scythians, three chiefs of the Iberians, two of the Albanians, and Menander the Laodicean, who had been the chief of cavalry to Mithridates. There were carried in the procession images of those who were not present, of Tigranes and of Mithridates, representing them as fighting and as vanquished and as fleeing. Even the besieging of Mithridates and his silent flight by night were represented. Finally it was shown how he died, and the daughters who perished with him were pictured also. And there were figures of the sons and daughters who died before him, and images of the barbarian gods decked out in the fashion of their countries. A tablet was born also with this inscription. Ships with brazen beaks captured, 800. Cities founded in Cappadocia, 8. In Cilicia and Col Syria, 20. In Palestine, the one which is now Seleucus. Kings conquered, Tigranes the Armenian, Ardokes the Iberian, Oroses the Albanian, Darius the Mede, Aretas the Nabataean, and Tychicus of Comageni. These were the facts recorded on the inscription. Pompey himself was born in a chariot studded with gems, wearing, it was said, a cloak of Alexander the Great, if anyone can believe that. This was supposed to have been found among the possessions of Mithridates that the inhabitants of Kos had received from Cleopatra. His chariot was followed by the officers who had shared the campaigns with him, some on horseback and others on foot. When he arrived at the capital, he did not put any of the prisoners to death, as had been the custom at other triumphs, but sent them all home at the public expense, except the kings. Of these, Aristobulus alone was shortly put to death, and Tigranes somewhat later. Such was the character of Pompey's triumph. Thus the Romans, having conquered King Mithridates at the end of forty-two years, reduced to subjection Bithynia, Cappadocia, and the other neighboring peoples dwelling near the Euxine Sea. 
In this same war, that part of Kilikia, which was not yet subject to them, together with the Syrian countries, Phoenicia, Kole Syria, Palestine, and the territory lying between them, and the river Euphrates, although they did not belong to Mithridates, were gained by the impetus of the victory over him, and were required to pay tribute, some immediately and others later. Paphlagonia, Galatia, Phrygia, and the parts of Mycia adjoining Phrygia, and in addition Lydia, Caria, Ionia, and all the rest of Asia Minor, formerly belonging to Pergamon, together with old Greece and Macedonia, that Mithridates had drawn away from them, were completely recovered. Many of these people who did not pay them tribute before were now subjected to it. For these reasons I think they especially considered this a great war, and called the victory which ended it the Great Victory, and gave the title of Great to Pompey, who gained it for them, by which the peculiar appellation he is called to this day, on account of the great number of nations recovered or added to their dominion, the length of time, forty years, that the war had lasted, and the courage and endurance that Mithridates had shown himself capable of in all emergencies. Many times he had over four hundred ships of his own, fifty thousand cavalry, and two hundred and fifty thousand infantry, with engines and arms in proportion. For allies he had the king of Armenia and the princes of the Scythian tribes around the Euxin and the Sea of Azov and beyond, as far as the Thracian Bosphorus. He held communications with the leaders of the Roman civil wars, which were then fiercely raging, and with those who were inciting insurrection in Spain. He established friendly relations with the Gauls for the purpose of invading Italy. From Kilikia to the Pillars of Hercules he filled the sea with pirates, who stopped all commerce and navigation between cities, and caused severe famine for a long time. In short, he left nothing within the power of man undone or untried to start the greatest possible movement, extending from the Orient to the Occident to vex, so to speak, the whole world, which was warred upon, tangled in alliances, harassed by pirates, or vexed by the neighborhood of the warfare. Such and so diversified was this one war, but in the end it brought the greatest gains to the Romans, for it pushed the boundaries of their dominion from the setting of the sun to the river Euphrates. It had been impossible to distinguish all these exploits by nations, since they were performed at the same time and were complicated with each other. Those which could be separated I have arranged by itself. Pharnaces besieged the Phanagoreans and the towns neighboring to the Bosphorus, until the former were compelled by hunger to come out and fight, where he overcame them in battle. Yet he did them no other harm, but made friends with them, took hostages, and withdrew. Not long afterward, he took Sinope and had a mind to take Amissus also, for which reason he made war against Calvinus, the Roman commander, at the time when Pompey and Caesar were contending against each other, until Asander, an enemy of his own, drew him away from Asia, while the Romans were still preoccupied. Afterward he fought with Caesar himself, when the latter had overthrown Pompey and returned from Egypt, near Mount Scotius, where his father had defeated the Romans under Triarius. He was beaten and fled to Sinope with a thousand cavalry. Caesar was too busy to follow him, but sent Domitius against him. He surrendered Sinope to Domitius, who agreed to let him go away with his cavalry. He killed his horses, though his men were extremely dissatisfied at this, then took ship and fled to the Bosphorus. Here he collected a force of Scythians and Sarmatians and captured Theodosia and Pantapachaeum. His enemy, Asander, attacked him again, and his men were defeated for want of horses, and because they were not accustomed to fighting on foot. Pharnaces alone fought valiantly until he died of his wounds, being then fifty years of age and having been king of the Bosphorus for fifteen years. Thus Pharnaces was cut off from his kingdom, and Caesar bestowed it upon Mithridates of Pergamon, who had rendered him very important help in Egypt. But the people of the Bosphorus now had rulers of their own, and a praetor was sent by the Senate yearly to govern Pontus and Bithynia. Although Caesar was offended with the other rulers who held their possessions as gifts from Pompey, since they had aided Pompey against him, nevertheless he confirmed their titles except the priesthood of Comana, which he took from Archelaus and gave to Lycomedes. Not long after, all these countries and those which Gaius Caesar or Mark Antony had given to others were made Roman provinces by Augustus Caesar, after he had taken Egypt, as the Romans needed only the slightest pretext in each case. Thus, 
Since their dominion had been advanced in consequence of the Mithridatic War, from Spain and the Pillars of Hercules to the Euxine Sea and the sands which border Egypt and the river Euphrates, it was fitting that this victory should be called the Great One, and that Pompey, who commanded the army, should be styled the Great. As they held Africa also as far as Cyrene, for Appion, the king of that country, a bastard of the house of the Logids, left Cyrene itself to the Romans in his will, Egypt alone was lacking to their grasp of the whole Mediterranean. End of Part 2 End of The Mithridatic Wars by Appian of Alexandria Translated by Horace White